Well, it's my great privilege to introduce our principal guest. Um, John Lennox is an Irishman, and so I'm proud to say a cousin of Scottish Gales like me. He went to Cambridge University to study mathematics. Academically, John Lennox was a standout. But while at Cambridge, uh, not only did he become a highly skilled mathematician, but someone who was regularly involved with fellow students and academic staff in discussing matters relating to God. It was not always appreciated. One day he was summoned to a meeting with several professors who advised him that if he wanted to make a successful academic career, he should drop the subject of God. <laughs> I'm not sure what your response was, John, but I think we can make a reasonable guess at what it might have been. Indeed, he went on to make the rational case for belief in God in many different forms and in many different countries, most uh, notably in the former Soviet Union, where he uh, debated the big philosophical questions, especially in Russia and the Ukraine, with some of the country's most erudite professors, and he learned their languages in order to do so. <laughs> Meantime, his academic career was flourishing, with a remarkable academic pedigree, including three doctorates. He was appointed professor of mathematics at Oxford University and a fellow in mathematics and the philosophy of science at the university's Green Templeton College. In 2006, John made an entry onto a different form of world stage when amidst huge publicity, he stepped into the arena with Richard Dawkins for the first time. The debate was streamed to millions worldwide. And not only <coughs> has he had further public encounters with Richard Dawkins, he has debated atheist heavyweights such as Christopher Hitchens, author of the book God Is Not Great, and Michael Shermer, editor of Skeptic magazine. I think in watching some of these exchanges online, I think I'm, I'm not alone in being hugely impressed, not only by John's intellect and extraordinary skill uh, as a debater, but by the graciousness and the constant good humor he displays in the midst of debate. John Lennox is also the author of a growing number of books on science and God. He also writes on biblical themes, such as his recently published book, Against the Flow, it studies in the book of Daniel. Please would you welcome Professor John Lennox with Ian Morris as they bring us tales from the international arena. Thank you, Angus, for your introduction. And I just expected the music to play as you, as you finished. It wasn't there, but thank you for your applause, welcoming Professor John Lennox. John, without any further ado, how did you get into this? international arena, and why do you do it? Well, I, as was mentioned, I grew up in Northern Ireland, which has a dubious reputation for its Christianity in terms of divisions. And right from the early days, I had a father who was very unusual in that he was Christian without being sectarian. And secondly, that he allowed me to think and got me interested in other world views. He gave me, for example, when I was about 13 or 14, a copy of the Communist Manifesto. And I said, why should I read that? He said, you need to know what other people think. He had no idea, of course, that I was going to spend many months in the communist world. But that idea that Christianity was not merely what my parents believed, but was true, set me with my innate curiosity about everything to really thinking about the Christian faith and how it cogs into reality and into my experience and into history and into science. And my dad discovered C.S. Lewis and introduced Lewis to me and I simply devoured this stuff. Because one of the gaps in my experience, if it could be called that, was I have no idea what it's like to be an adult and not a believer. And because C.S. Lewis became an adult and then became a believer, I found him a great guide 
to the inside of the atheist mind. And that was enormously helpful. Now, two things influenced me greatly at Cambridge. The first was my inevitable challenge as someone from Ireland. A student very early on asked me at dinner one night, did I believe in God? And then he remembered where I came from and he said, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I should never have asked you that. All you Irish believe in God and you fight about it. <laughs> well, somehow, although I'd heard that before, it's the old Freudian challenge. On that day I said, well, I've never really had the opportunity to befriend people that don't share my worldview. So the very next day I started doing that and I've spent my entire life doing it. The second incident was the one that Angus referred to just now. Because the scientist who tried to talk me out of my faith was actually a Nobel Prize winner. And was the first I'd ever met. And I tried to speak to him at dinner and he clearly didn't like anything that went in the direction of God. So I left it and after the dinner he asked me to his room with a number of other professors and he set me down and they surrounded me. And he said, Lennox, do you want a career in science? I said, yes, sir. He said, well, give up this God business tonight in front of witnesses because if you don't, you will never make it. You will suffer by comparison with your peers and so on. Now that experience put steel into my heart that's never left it. I vowed that day that if ever I had the opportunity to be in a position to talk to young people, I would want to have a fair and free discussion and give them both sides of the argument and allow them to make up their own minds. So that was one of the leading things. And I suppose then I began to give talks on science and Christianity. I was invited to do it in Spain. And then, because of my interest in atheism, when I learned German, having done some research in Germany, I was invited to East Germany. And that opened up a whole new world of being able to see what atheism does to a culture and a society. And even more so, when the wall fell, I started to go to Russia as a guest of the Academy of Sciences. I didn't know this was preparation for the kind of debates with Richard Dawkins, but somehow uh, I believe that God guided my life in bits and pieces to put all sorts of facilities and resources into my mind and heart so that when I eventually was enormously surprised to be invited to appear with Richard Dawkins in Birmingham, Alabama. Well, the rest is history. So I, I wanted to ask you, what does it feel like just moments before you go on stage? You can take the Richard Dawkins, Alabama debate as an example. Before you, you enter the ring with an atheist who is committed to the intellectual destruction of the very thing you stand for, what is that like? Terror. I mean, it is very scary, this kind of thing. And certainly with Dawkins, it's the scariest of all, because I'd seen evidences of his anger and all this kind of thing. And I had never met him in Oxford. I met him first at lunchtime that day in Alabama, and we were questioned about our interest in science, and that all went pretty well. And I remember that when we walked onto the stage, just before we were in the wings, he said to me, by the way, you know, I don't debate. Well, he didn't add what he had frequently added before. I don't debate to legitimize people like you. But he said, I don't debate. And I said, well, never mind, Richard. I don't. I've never done a thing like it before. But I said, if it's any encouragement to you, what I intend to do is to try to demonstrate to the people here that there is a rational alternative to your atheism and let them decide. And he said, I buy, I'll buy that, and on we went. And the debate that you had, I can say this because I was present, um, the debate that you had actually went especially well for you. And one could tell, even by Richard Dawkins' body language, that he had encountered somebody that he hadn't counted on. Um, and he was quite upset by that. So that when John uh, Lennox and Richard Dawkins were invited to a second debate 
in Oxford. Some time later, Richard Dawkins came with a different mindset. And just so that we can all feel the heat of what it's like to step into the ring with this man, this is how he began the Oxford debate. John Lennox is a scientist who believes that Jesus turned water into wine. A scientist who believes that Jesus somehow influenced all those molecules of H2O and introduced proteins and carbohydrates and tannins and, and alcohol and turned it into wine. He believes that Jesus walked on water. I had been accustomed to debating with sophisticated theologians and I come across John Lennox, who is a scientist who believes in all those things. That is profoundly unscientific. Not only is it unscientific, it doesn't do justice to the grandeur of the universe. That is not how you anticipated the debate would start, because you were given the question, has science buried God? And that's what you were faced with. How much of a surprise was that? How shocking was it? How did you react? Well, it was a considerable shock. And as you can see, it was coming out of left field and I had to decide very rapidly that because the thing had gone off course, that I would have to be the person that would steer it back on. And that was very difficult to do. It's one thing to participate, it's another thing to moderate, and it's worst of all to have to do both at once. So I had to think, how do you damp this aggression in some kind of way to get a reasonable debate? Because I could tell before we went on stage that he was extremely angry with me. And using ridicule, of course, is a foolish thing to do, but you see, that's what he did. But at least he got the impression I believed something. You'll have noticed that. I actually... <coughs> What I'd like to share with the folks here is how you did react. And just before we play the clip, you might want to think of how you might react to something like that. You're in a public stage, the cameras are trained in your direction, and the world is waiting to see how you will react. Um, you could go on the counter-attack, you could become aggressive. Um, not John Lennox, who disarms people with a smile. You could sit here all night, and you probably would not predict this. If you're going to say, that Jesus was born of a virgin, that Jesus walked on water, that he turned water into wine. That is palpably anti-scientific. I can make it worse for you. I know you can. <laughs> because <laughs> Jesus actually claimed to be the Logos that created the whole universe. And if this is the creator incarnate, making water into wine and so on is really a triviality. The, the, the more fundamental thing is the fact that he claimed to be and gave evidence that he was God. When you say it's anti-scientific, I don't think it's anti-scientific at all. Science cannot say that miracles do not occur. It can say they're highly improbable. But nobody is claiming that these things occurred by natural processes. They, they occurred because God fed his power in. And he went on making it worse for Richard Dawkins throughout um, m m most of the evening. Um, John, when you, you prepare for a debate, what do you actually do? How much preparation is involved? I mean, Richard Dawkins, we know, didn't do any preparation for the debate in Alabama. He thought he would just sweep you off the table. What do you do? It's sad, actually, that attitude, because it reflects a whole cultural idea that Christians don't think. And of course, if you go back to the time of early Christianity and the Church Fathers, they outthought their opponents. And he didn't prepare, and he regretted it, I think, afterwards. But my preparation for that, because I'd never done anything like it before, took months. I read and reread all of his books. I made all sorts of notes of possible scenarios. And of course, it was a confrontational debate of the type where you have to say something for a few minutes and then there's a response and so on. Those have gone out of fashion for good reasons that we can come to. But each one of those little contributions, I had to prepare dozens of them, and alternatives and all kinds of things. 
and things did go wrong because unfortunately a radio station intervened in the whole thing and cut it short. And you will remember that because you were there. We were suddenly just given two minutes to finish instead of probably 15 or 20. So there was lots to be done, but what I did was to read all of his books, reread them, make notes on them, watch his other debates such as they were, talk to people about the issues and, and so on. It was it, it took literally very many months, eight or nine hours a day, to prepare for that. And I think that one of the things that you, you've been up against, therefore, is that atheists, particularly very prominent, I shouldn't say atheists, some very prominent atheists don't take the Christian worldview seriously. That idea permeates into the wider society, and so we're facing a situation where Christianity struggles to be taken seriously. And that's what John Lennox has been about, and that's what Grasping the Nettle is about as well. Further illustration of that failure and unwillingness to take the Christian worldview seriously came from an interview that we did with um, Christopher Hitchens just the night before he was due to debate John Lennox in Edinburgh's Usher Hall. And we asked him the question, Christopher, what preparation do you do for a debate like this with John Lennox? There isn't going to be any new argument. Those who defend the Christian worldview are stuck with the one they've always been stuck with. It's, it's wrong of me to expect that they will come up with original material. Um, it either is or is not a matter of intellectual and moral integrity. So I don't do any prep. Um, and I don't want to say that in a, in a complacent manner. I mean, I do know what their arguments are. Mm -hmm. I judge them afterwards by whether or not they understand my position, which so far they, they, have, they have not. I've never yet met any religious believer who understands what it is to be a person without faith. So, John, there is much to discuss with atheists and much that we have to require them to take seriously. And you and I decided that there are three big issues that need to be discussed in, in which the Christian view goes into the ring in a respectful way with atheism. And those three topics are the universe and its intelligibility, and I'm going to ask you to say what we mean by that in a moment, and the whole business of life on Earth, and then there's this phenomenon called human consciousness, or, or, or if you like, the, the, the human mind. Would you agree that these are the three big agenda items about which there is much to discuss and in which the whole argument rests? Well, of course they are, because people are desperate to find meaning, and quite rightly so. And they want to place themselves in a big meta-narrative. And a person without a history is a person without an identity. So there is a huge battle in our culture for origins. What do we make of origins? And therefore, these three things are at the forefront of the agenda. And they come up all the time, inevitably so. What, do you, what would you say? is the big question, the big issue with respect to the universe? Well, <clears throat> the situation is co in cosmology is so interesting at the moment because we've got to a stage where by and large, with some exceptions, cosmologists believe that space-time had a beginning. And what is more, that forces them to ask the question, well, what's behind that? What causes that to exist? That's a question you cannot avoid asking. And they ask it. They also notice that in the past 50 years or so, we've discovered that the constants of nature, the basic constants of physics, are very fine-tuned in order to make carbon-based life possible. And that raises a big question for someone like Stephen Hawking, who in his book, The Grand Design, he says he sees this, and it demands an explanation. And then he goes on to say some people prefer the old explanation that God caused the universe to be. But that is not the answer of modern science. The answer of modern science, according to him, at that stage was in terms of a multiverse. And you can just see coming through that what C.S. Lewis beautifully calls chronological snobbery, because it's old, it's false. Well, I'm old, and I hope I'm not false. Um, and his view, 
And this is what got me onto this, was I was just staggered when I, raised, when I read his central argument in the Grand Design, best-selling book. Because there is a law of gravity, the universe can and will create itself from nothing. Well, I was staggered, and I wrote a book about it as a result, because it just struck me as absurd philosophically. Because there is a law of gravity, because there is something, the universe creates itself from nothing. Flat contradiction number one. And then saying, because there's a law of gravity. He didn't say because gravity exists, and that's a huge philosophical mistake. Laws don't create anything. They don't even move anything. Newton's laws of motion have never moved a billiard ball in the history of the universe. People with cues do that. And this alerted me to a very big gap in his understanding. And it was very interesting that virtually giving an obituary, the Astronomer Royal, Lord Rees, said very interestingly to my mind, he said, I know Stephen Hawking very well. And he knows very little philosophy and no theology, and we should not listen to a word he says on it. Now, that, I thought, isn't that fascinating? The trouble is, people do listen. Why did he listen? Because he is a famous and brilliant scientist. But as I often say, not every statement of a scientist is a statement of science. So what we've got, Ian, is a very interesting polarization. We're now reduced to a choice between God or nothing as responsible for the universe. And I think we have to push that very hard. This is, this is very, very interesting. Um, because when you actually get into the nitty gritty of this kind of stuff with atheism, as you know, and indeed as I know, um, suddenly they're not so smart, actually. And sometimes they begin just to, 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 to rock a little bit. And I've got an example of that from, from the screen now. Back in that debate in Oxford, um, where John has escaped this harangue that he's had about being a scientist who believes that you can turn water into wine. And we've actually got down to talking about cosmology. And so John introduces the idea of the universe being created and the, 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 some of the evidence of that being the fine tuning of the universe, which we don't have time to um, elucidate tonight. But if you want to see more about that, get a hold of the God Question series and you'll find yourself well educated uh, in, in that area. And he wants to get Richard Dawkins' attention on this. And as I looked at this clip, I began to realize that Richard Dawkins doesn't want to talk about this. He wants to talk about something else. He wants to talk about Darwin, where he feels much more comfortable. But we're not about just making atheists comfortable. Why doesn't Richard Dawkins respond to the question that's asked? I'll leave you with that question as you consider the evidence before you on the screen. Perhaps the best way to start would be this. As a scientist, um, we both believe in the rational intelligibility of the universe. I believe the universe is rationally intelligible because there's a creator God behind it. Now, how do you account for the rational intelligibility of the universe? Well, John, you said that I believe that the universe is a freak accident, which is the opposite of, in, of, of what you believe. Um, for many years, uh, for many centuries indeed, it seemed perfectly obvious that it couldn't possibly be a freak accident because you only had to look at living creatures, the sort of magnificent diversity we see in this in this museum, and everything looks designed. And so it was clearly preposterous to suggest that it was due to any kind of freak accident. Darwin came along and showed that it's not actually a freak accident, but nor is it designed. There's, there's a third way, which in the case of biology is evolution by natural selection, which produces a close imitation of something that is designed. So, John, if you had been marking the, uh, Richard Dawkins' answer, as a contribution to an examination paper where you'd ask a question and that was the answer, what mark would you have given it? Zero. <laughs> For a very obvious reason. He's dodged the question of the universe. And the one thing Darwin didn't deal with was the origin of the universe. In fact, he envisaged, even when it came to life, that God was behind it, certainly in the early editions of The Origin of Species. But it's a clear example of 
what politicians occasionally do. They don't like the question, so they answer a different question. But he didn't even answer that question, but it was a clear dodge. The fact that he wants to dodge it tells you what? Well, it tells me that this business of the rational intelligibility of the universe is a hugely important issue for a number of reasons. The first reason is it's a central argument that scripture uses. The Genesis story, and God said, and God said, which is summarized at the beginning of John, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things came to be through the Word. This is a Word-based rational universe, and we see evidence of it in the fact at various levels, that it is law-like, that those laws can be described in terms of a very precise language of mathematics, and at the biological level that we find so many things that are linguistic in form that we have to use computer language to describe them, like the genetic code. That all resonates together. But if you're an atheist, you've got a huge problem because why would an atheist believe that the universe is rationally intelligible? And every scientist has got to believe it. You won't do science if you do not believe that your reason can penetrate at least to a certain extent into understanding the world around you. And this is an argument that C.S. Lewis picked up and more recently some atheists have picked up. Lewis pointed out the very obvious logical fact that any theory that invalidates human reason cannot be true because you've used human reason to get to it. That's the first point. And the thing is this, if, as Dawkins believes, the thing that does the science is the human mind or the brain as they think because they distinguish, they don't distinguish between brain and mind, and that's another fascinating question, then as I often ask my scientific friends, just for fun, I say, tell me the story of what you do science with inside your head. And they frequently tell me, well, the short story is that the brain is the end product of a mindless, unguided process. And I smile at them and they say, and you trust it. And I say, honestly, tell me, if you knew that your computer was the end product of a mindless, unguided process, would you trust it? And I always force an answer, and I've never got the answer yes. So I said, you have a problem. This is a huge leap of blind faith. You have no reason to trust your reason to do science. Now, it's interesting when Christians say that. It's far more interesting when atheists say it. And there's a brilliant philosopher called Thomas Nagel in New York who wrote the very famous article, What It's Like to Be a Bat. And Thomas Nagel has written a book with a very provocative subtitle. It's called Mind and Cosmos, Why the Neo-Darwinian View of the World is Almost Certainly False. Now this is an atheist, a hard atheist. He doesn't want there to be a God. But his point is this. If the biological theory is right, that tells us that the brain is simply the end product of a mindless, unguided process, then why on earth should we believe anything it says to us? And he says this is a huge problem. Well, of course it's a problem. And what I notice is that in many situations with scientists, when I try to use that argument, they dodge it as fast as they can because the existence of information at all of these levels within science is a threat to the atheist worldview, which my main reason for rejecting it, apart from my Christianity, is it doesn't make sense of my doing science. So I take it that you don't agree with Richard Dawkins then when he claims that Darwin has buried God. No, not at all. Um, I think Darwin explained everything we need to know about no, the origin no, no. of life and, <laughs> the, and life's development and diversification and so on. Isn't that the nail in the, in the atheist coffin? Well, it would be if it were true. And it would be possibly if Darwin claimed it, which he didn't. The great confusion here, ladies and gentlemen, is that for years, 
Dawkins has set up an intellectual fog in our society. And he set it up by writing a book which is very well written, enviable abilities that is writing called The Blind Watchmaker. And the central thesis of The Blind Watchmaker is that natural selection, the blind, automatic, etc., process that Darwin discovered is the explanation for, note, the existence and variation of all life. But it isn't the explanation for the existence of life for an utterly trivial logical reason. Because evolution, whatever it does or doesn't do, depends on the existence of life before it gets get started. And therefore it cannot be the explanation for the existence of life. And yet for years he defended that, but he's changed his mind. He's had to put it in a more recent book. So Darwin gets blamed for a lot of things, and it's a big subject on its own, but certainly Darwin has not buried God at all. Of course, when you get to a point where you are tired of trying to defend atheism against the kind of arguments that uh, you're advancing, then one can retreat to another area altogether, which is the question of who made God, which many people think is the game set and match question uh, for Christians. And um, here's a, a, an example. This time the excerpt is taken from the famous Alabama debate, which preceded the Oxford debate. So here's the issue. Oh, I should say just before the clip comes that the gentleman in the centre of the screen is the moderator. And um, what he did, what, not of the Church of Scotland, um, Susan, another kind of moderator altogether, um, but what he did was to, uh, because this was the God delusion debate, and what he did was to read excerpts from the God delusion, ask Richard Dawkins for a comment, and John Lennox for a response. What you wrote what is you this. The whole argument turns on the familiar question, who made God? which most thinking people discover for themselves. A designer God cannot be used to explain organized complexity because any God capable of designing anything would have to be complex enough to demand the same kind of explanation in his own right. This argument, as I shall show in the next chapter, demonstrates that God, though not technically disprovable, is very, very improbable indeed. I want to address the who designed the designer question because it's the old schoolboy question, who created God. I, I'm actually very surprised to find it as a central argument in your book because it assumes that God is created. And I'm not surprised therefore that you call the book the God delusion because created gods are by definition a delusion. <laughs> now I know and I ought to explain that Richard doesn't like people who say to him that they don't believe in the God he doesn't believe in. But I think that this is possibly touching a sore spot because you leave yourself wide open to the charge. After all, you are arguing that God is a delusion. And in order to weigh your argument... Yeah, that You said what? I, I said that it is you who's arguing that God is a delusion. Oh, sorry. All right, thank you. And in order to weigh that argument, I need to know what you mean by God. And if you say, if there is a God, you have to ask who created God, that means that you're reduced to thinking about created gods. Well, none of us believe in created gods, Jews, Muslims, or Christians. The God who created the universe, ladies and gentlemen, was not created. He is eternal. This is the fundamental distinction between God and the universe. It came to exist, he did not. And this is precisely the point the Christian apostle John makes at the beginning of his gospel. In the beginning was the Word. The Word already was. All things came to be by him. God is uncreated. The universe was created by him. You can see um, why Richard Dawkins came to Oxford, a very angry young man. Um, but let me just turn the question around the other way. Uh, I mean, what issues that atheists um, raise with you um, give you a bit of a challenge and pause for thought? Well, certainly not that one. <laughs> and what's not on the clip was the fun I had just afterwards where I applied Richard's question to him. I said, you believe the universe created you, so let me ask you your question. Who created your creator? 
I've been waiting, what, 12 years for an answer to that? I haven't got it yet. So that was just surprising that he made the whole book essentially depend on this utterly thin, in fact, non-existent argument that doesn't even address the question of an eternal God. But there are more serious arguments. On when you say what aspects of the atheist worldview are most difficult to handle, well, first of all, it can be the people that are difficult to handle. And I fortunately haven't met many of those because my whole objective, as I said earlier, is to befriend people. And I'll try and do that in public, if possible. But as for arguments, I think, and I'm delighted to see that you have a project on this, the hardest question for anybody, whether they're atheist or not, is the problem of pain and suffering and the existence of evil. That is clearly the hardest question. And it's a question you have to deal with with great sensitivity. I will never forget having to debate with a very famous expert on euthanasia, Professor of Philosophy, Margaret Batten, in the University of Utah. And she's written a standard work for OUP. And I agreed to debate her. And then I was told just on the day of the debate that her husband had had an accident and was on a life support system in the hospital. And she had had to make the decision to turn it off. And I thought, this is unbelievable. How can we possibly debate what was the topic? The problem of suffering. So I said, I can't do this unless I have a meal with her. So I had a meal with her. And we chatted and we skated around and then I said, look, Margaret, let me come to the point. Everybody in the audience tonight is going to know of the awful position you were put in. As an author who'd written about euthanasia and as a wife who'd had to turn a machine off, would you mind if I mentioned it? And she said, would you? I said, I'd be honored to, but do you really want to discuss this? She said, I want to discuss it. So we went into the room, there's a huge crowd of students there because he's very well known, a couple of thousand students, I suppose. And I thought, what do I do? So I stood up at the beginning and I said, before we say anything, I want you to realize that my opponent in this debate is an extremely brave person. And she's been faced with a dilemma that probably none of us in this room have ever faced, and I hope we never will. So I want all of you to listen to her with the greatest of respect as we go through. At the end of the debate, she came over to me and she threw her arms around me, and she called the photographer over. And she said, I want a photograph. I said, why? She said, my colleagues will never believe that such a photograph could be taken. Thank you so much. And that kind of experience I find deeply moving because here's someone you expect to debate against when at the end of the evening you find that something very deep ha has occurred. So that was a very difficult situation but it turned out very well. It's a complete different from, completely different from the situation where you're dealing with anger and emotion and antagonism. So much to develop there. Um, the time is flying and I've got my eye very firmly on the clock. You and I said that we would touch on three big central subjects. Um, one is the cosmos, another is life. We've, we've touched on those, no more. And the third is mind. And I want to um, remind us that one of the big differences between atheism and theism is that atheists must argue that everything came bottom up. So that the something as complex and wonderful as the human mind uh, somehow uh, developed from very simple beginnings and became much more complex. And it's something that uh, you were faced with in a, a debate with Michael Shermer. 
uh, who, uh, who, in response to a question from the, from the audience, said this. Listen to Michael Shermer and listen to John's response on this crucially important subject of the human mind. In short, um, mind is a word to describe behaviors, actions, particular cognitive processes, and so on. It's a little bit of a fuzzy word that most neuroscientists are uncomfortable using. And therefore, I think it's better to talk about specific things, like you have a particular kind of thought that drives a particular kind of behavior. What is the cause of that? Consciousness is an emergent property of a billion, billion neurons uh, firing in particular patterns and nothing else. John, would you have anything to add to that? Well, I admire this man's faith. I really do. <laughs> Consci- no using the F word. <laughs> I am, yes. <laughs> Consciences is nothing but a firing of a billion neurons, but there's not a scrap of evidence for it. Uh, asking the neuroscientists in Cambridge, uh, in Oxford, sorry, they tell me no one knows what consciousness is. No one even knows, ladies and gentlemen, what energy is. And I think what really this question illustrates is the difference between our two worldviews. The one worldview starts off with matter energy. And because it doesn't believe in anything transcendent, it is forced to confine all explanation to be ultimately reductionist and totally bottom-up. And I think that that leads us to uh, an absurdity, actually, because you cannot explain the immaterial things that you've mentioned, which really do exist, of course. You cannot explain the existence of something that carries meaning without inputting an intelligence. So that the biblical notion, in the beginning was the word, makes far more sense to me than the notion, in the beginning were the particles. And we have to decide which of the two worldviews makes sense. So John, just for our benefit, because it's a crucially important point, what's the difference between in the beginning was the word and in the beginning was the particle? The views, and this makes it really stark, uh, when I said in the beginning was the particles, I probably should have said in the beginning was nothing, because it's nothing pitched against a creator gone. And the two worldviews, the atheistic worldview, starts with nothing and ends up by a series of phenomena that are not understood with mind and the idea of God, because God doesn't exist. The Christian worldview has some bottom-up explanations, but the main one is top-down. It's in the beginning God. That is the prime reality, is God who is spirit. It's not matter at all. So there's a head-on clash here. And I am a bit allergic to words like emergent because I, Richard Dawkins, I challenged him in my earlier career at Oxford when he used this word. And I said, give us an example of an emergent phenomenon. Now those were uh, the crude old days of simple computers, and he, t- he said the word processing capacity of a computer is emergent. And I said, but the word processing capacity of a computer depends on a huge intelligent input. It emerges, but with the addition of a whole lot of things. So when people use the word emergent, I say emerges how? Automatically, or with the addition of energy? Or does it emerge with the addition of a catalyst? Or does it emerge with the addition of energy plus a catalyst plus an informational input? Just to say it emerges when you've got billions and billions of atoms and you haven't any experimental evidence whatsoever that that is the case. Now, I'm no neuroscientist, but I love to read what they're saying. And some of them I've talked to, they're very honest about this. We haven't a notion from a scientific perspective of what consciousness is. We can have a look at the brain story by scanning. But how do you relate the brain story to the mind story? Uh, a neuroscientist can tell me what's in my brain. He can't tell me what's in my mind. There's a difference between the two stories. Now, these things are utterly 
fascinating. But I think that what comes out of this is the desperation to create what Rudyard Kipling would call a just so story. Because you have to do it that way. This is one of the few areas of intellectual activity where a philosophy can actually dictate what you think you're going to eventually find in science because it's the only possible explanation. If there is no God, the only possible explanation of mind is that it is a natural phenomenon. And so you will look forever and ever to find natural sources. Now, of course, it involves natural phenomena, and that is a legitimate space for science to work in. But if you assume from the beginning that there's no such thing as top-down causation, and of course science doesn't tell you there's no such thing. I would want to argue, as I did a few minutes ago, that the very fact we can do science shows that there is a top-down causation at the deepest possible level. So it seems to me to be progressively thinner and thinner until you end up thinking that the emperor maybe has no clothes whatsoever. I hope you're disappointed about this, but I really have to steer this conversation towards a conclusion. I might also just say that the last item in the program, instead of John being 10 minutes at the podium talking, is just going to be the answer to a question. So we are heading for the, uh, the conclusion of our uh, evening. Some of you have a distance um, to go. John, what you're um, saying reminds me of the, a book title that I thought was very attractive. I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. Would you subscribe to that? I would with all kinds of qualifications because it buys into the atheist concept of faith. And the atheist concept of faith is doing serious damage to our culture. The atheist concept of faith is believing where you know there's no evidence. And that's actually got into one of the world's big dictionaries, Webster's Dictionary, faith noun, believing where there is no evidence. Now faith in English comes from the Latin word fides, which means trust and reliability. And unless we're fools, we base our trust on evidence. And we learn that, if not before, if we try and get a loan from a bank manager. He'll want plenty of evidence before he lends us the money. We all know what evidence-based faith is. And the Christian faith is evidence-based. Now that's a huge topic in itself. So to say I don't have enough faith to be an atheist, I would never say that. I would say I don't have enough blind faith to be an atheist. I don't have enough credulity to be an atheist because I believe that atheism is based on very insubstantial foundations. And I'm a Christian because I believe that there is evidence on which my faith can be based. The trouble with this whole thing is that people like ourselves in this room tonight are regarded by many atheists as people of faith. And that is an insult. Because we're people that believe where there's no evidence, so there's no point in talking to us. And I want to change that and say everybody is a person of faith. You see, Hitchens couldn't see this. He wrote in one of his books, our beliefs are not a belief, our faith is not a faith. Well, that's just sheer nonsense. And Dawkins says, atheists have no faith, and then he writes a 400-page book on what he believes. I mean, that is very serious failure to understand what faith actually means. And we have to articulate into our society and correct that notion, which is why I'm so pleased with your series, because that's one of the things it does do. So I'm not gullible enough to be an atheist, is my view, but I'm prepared to defend it. We attracted these people here this evening by asking one big fundamental question. How does the Christian worldview fare in the arena with atheism? What's your answer to that? You've been there. Well, I think it, it fares brilliantly. If only you can get it into the public arena. Our media aren't exactly neutral, are they? And that's the sad tragedy. That's why I'm so delighted. You heard how many countries the God question has been screened on. What about the UK? It doesn't happen here. And why is that? Well, I can tell you that the reason um, that we receive from the BBC is, well, we've done God. 
Well, we need to do God a bit more in public. We certainly do. And it is just a tragedy because young people will respond if they're given these facts. And that's where all of us tonight can get involved because if there's anything in this stuff, and of course there's something in it, that's why you're here. We need to get engaged and cooperate to get it across, to raise the profile. So it will no longer be regarded as uncool to think and talk about God in our school and university situations. We mustn't create safe spaces for God, that people won't talk about God because they're in a safe space. Why can't we, and we're, we've crossed the line into our last area of inquiry, why can't we just leave it to experts like you? Because we're not allowed to, if we're Christian. You know, the Apostle Peter wrote to people and he said, always be ready to give a defense to those that ask you a reason concerning the hope that is within you. And the way he put it, always be ready to give a defense to those that ask you, is envisaging one-on-one -on -one dialogue. And therefore, I take it as mandatory that if I believe this stuff, how can I possibly not share it? Because there's a world out there that's desperate for meaning. And meaning has been removed from them by the abolition of God. You can see that in our cultures around the world. And so the main mantra of humanism today is, no, there is no meaning or purpose. You have to put meaning into, this, into the cosmos. But the Christian worldview is that the God behind the cosmos is the one who gives you meaning. And we need to recover that. And we need to therefore cooperate and you know, I'm encouraged. There were only a handful of disciples. And they faced a world exactly like ours, except there were very few, many fewer believers in the true God in the New Testament world. And yet they went out and because they were well connected and well networked together and cooperated. I read a very interesting thing. In fact, I'll get the correct quote for you because I might quote it wrong. Lee, there's a fascinating book by a Jewish writer called Homo Deus, the uh, a Brief History of Tomorrow. And in many ways it's a scary book because he's talking about what is going to happen in the culture and on the way through he discusses how it is that small groups of people had huge influence. And he says this, if you want to launch a revolution, don't ask yourself, how many people support my ideas? Instead, ask yourself, how many of my supporters are capable of effective collaboration? And I thought, yes, that's exactly it. We need to get involved in effective collaboration. Um, you, you're describing grasping the nettle. You think this was planned. You would, wouldn't you? <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we owe him, the whole church owes him, an enormous debt of gratitude. Please show your appreciation for Professor Ryan. <laughs>